Well, uh, welcome to uh, City First Church. My name is Ryan, and uh, I want to take a moment to yeah. greet. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I got, I got about 10 people in the crowd, a couple fans. That's cool, you know, glad to be here. <laughs> I want to take a moment to greet everybody watching online and our God Behind Bars locations. Come on, why don't you make some noise for them? We love you guys. Uh, I, I get the privilege of uh, kicking off a brand new series uh, that we're doing throughout the holidays um, called a, a Place to Belong, A Place to Belong. And um, I, I don't know if, if you have been uh, church shopping or church hopping or you've been looking for a, a place to belong, but I believe um, that more than just uh, belonging to a great church, I, I believe belonging to um, a community of faith is, is so important. And um, oftentimes there can be barriers of entry where you're going, man, what, what's it, what do I have to do to belong to, to the club of Christians or, or whatnot? And, and throughout this series, we want to look at uh, how Jesus qualified people to belong. And um, I, I want to look in Mark chapter 2, verse 13. The Bible says this, he went out again beside the sea and all the crowd was coming to him and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And the Bible says, and he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners, and tax collectors said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came to call the righteous, not the righteous, but sinners. Over the next few moments, I want to speak to you on the subject of everyone is welcome. Can we pray? Father, I thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to uh, speak your word today. And Lord, I pray that uh, people in this room, people that are watching online would have a moment uh, where they realize that you have done so much to invite them to a table, that you have done so much to qualify them to have a place to belong. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said. Uh, one of the first jobs I had uh, coming out of college was um, a job where I did headhunting for churches. So if you don't know what headhunting is, it's where uh, you do recruiting and you, you, go, you do networking and you try and help clients and help people uh, find great employees. And so I was doing that for churches. So a church would call our company and I would help them find pastors or worship leaders or youth pastors. And so um, I would go to a bunch of leadership conferences. I would search online databases, do whatever I could, call friends and say, hey, I've got this great church. They're looking for a worship leader. They're looking for this or that. And we would kind of create parameters to uh, have what we would call qualified candidates. Now, to have qualified candidates, there had to be un qualified candidates, okay? Now, how we unqualified somebody, most of the time, they will unqualify themselves. So, if a church called us and said, hey, you know, we're looking for uh, this, a great worship leader, and then somebody would send me a video of them singing. Well, the thing to qualify you to be a worship leader where people sing along with you is you have to be able to sing, okay? Like, that's, that's, that's pretty basic and uh, sometimes people didn't realize that, and so I would have to call them and say, hey, man, you should be an usher at the church. No, I didn't say that. But um, I would have to figure out a way to say, hey, man, maybe, maybe the Lord is calling you to something else. They say, well, I, got, I have a heart for worship. I said, that's good for you and Jesus, but for the rest of us, we, we need you to be able to sing, bro. Um, there, there are, there are uh, other things that would sort of disqualify people uh, when it came to their resume, some people be lying on their resume, acting like we weren't going to find out that you didn't work at the last place that you said that you weren't. We, we have phones. Um, the other thing that they would do is they would send me these really long resumes. If it's 10 pages, listen, I ain't got time to read no 10 pages. Like, that's, that's way, not, now you're just fluffing stuff. Um, every now and then, I, a guy would, would mail me his resume. One guy mailed me a 15-page resume, and the cover page was him 
um, in a suit holding his cat. It scared me, okay? <laughs> it literally scared me to death. And I'm like, we're not hiring you, dude. This, is, this just isn't happening. The craziest thing that people would do is um, when I would call and check their references. Now, I would advise anyone that is, is, is searching for a job to put people on your resume that will give you a good referral, okay? I, I did not, I thought that was common knowledge, but clearly I would call these references some of their friends. And they'd be like, don't hire them. I'm like, excuse me? Aren't you his brother? Like, what's going on, you know? Like, I, I mean, how did this happen? I mean, uh, unfortunately, I believe every single person under the sound of my voice has experienced a moment where they have felt unqualified. I, I believe that every single person, if there's no one that is exempt from having a moment where you just simply felt like you were not good enough. Uh, maybe it was with a job and you either lost a job or you were applying for one or, or maybe you're in that season now and you've, you're constantly feeling this rejection or perhaps it's a relationship and, and they broke up with you or there was this divorce and you just felt like you weren't good enough and you see them with somebody else and you go, oh, so that's what you really wanted and, and you just feel like you're not them and you just feel like you're not good enough or, or maybe um, you applied to a college and they said, hey, your, your grades aren't good enough. Or, or, there, there's, there's all of us that have a moment where we just simply feel unqualified. And perhaps I believe the place that humanity feels the most unqualified is when it comes to connecting with God. I mean, how many of you are going to have dinner, going to have lunch with some people at a table for Thanksgiving this week? And the number one reason they're not Christians is because they believe they're not good enough. I mean, I wonder how many people are in the building right now that have fallen on their knees to a holy God and simply felt inadequate for connection. Like, why in the world would God want to connect with me? And there are a lot of people in our world. There are a lot of people in the 815. There are a lot of people in Florida. There are a lot of people that simply believe that they can't come to our gathering because they're not worthy of connection. They won't even come in the building because they feel like they aren't good enough. They feel like, hey, the people that are in this room right now, they have great Christian resumes. They know Bible verses. They know the worship songs. They're well-churched and well-versed and well-dressed. And they feel like when they come in, they're simply not good enough. And so maybe the biggest barrier to entry for them to be a Christ follower is this idea that they're just simply not qualified. They believe, well, once I get my act together, then I, I can start coming to church. Because you know what? And I got, I got a lot of lost friends, and I love it, because they always give me their reasons why they don't go to church. Some of them say, Jesus just wants my money. I'm like, Jesus got money. He don't need yours, homie. <laughs> Do you know Jesus? Like, like they'll, they'll say, man, well, once, once I get it together, I still cuss a little. I still drink a little. I go, you should see some people in my church. Okay, I'm telling you, <laughs> they, they still do that too. Like, they're, they're, they, they believe that it is about behavior modification. That, that we are a gathering of people that have just modified our behavior to a place that God would then accept us. It's like, no, 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 no. We are a bunch of people that have had our souls transformed. So our behavior just happens to line up with that. And so because our souls have been transformed, we just simply said, you know, I want to respond to the grace of God in a way that makes me go, okay, that's why people got their hands up during worship. It's not because they're super spiritual. It's that they've been forgiven so much. And they've been forgiven so much, they go, listen, you might have a little Thanksgiving holiday, but I'm just so grateful that God saved me. So, so when I throw my hands up, it's not because I'm trying to impress you. I'm just that great. And we see this thing in the Bible where Jesus doesn't call the righteous. He, he calls sinners. Now, what you got to understand something about Jesus is he is sent to the planet by his dad. And, he's, and dad says, I got one mission for you. The mission is really simple. Save everybody. I mean, you, you have to save the world. I mean, you, we, have, we see movies all the time, okay? Like, like the world is going to end and somebody has to save the world. We need a justice league, okay? Like we need 
this great team of people that are going to save the world. We see that in movies, but this is real. Jesus really does need to save the world. And so for him to save the world, he's going to need somebody to help him. He's going to need a team. He's going to need to hire some employees. And the Bible says, in, in the Gospel of Mark, he says the very first person, the, first, the number one draft pick, if you will, is Levi, who is a tax collector. Now, the first thing you must ask yourself upon further review of this text is who is Levi and what is a tax collector? And when you think of tax collector in the Bible, don't think of the IRS, okay? That, 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 this is completely, a completely different mind frame. And like, what you have to understand is, is when uh, there was a, a tax booth, a tax collector could sit at his booth, and uh, if you owed taxes, you could, he could collect the taxes as you walk by. But the difference was this. Um, in this society, tax collectors were the scum of society. Everybody hated tax collectors. Because uh, it, it wasn't just um, the guy that was doing tax collecting. Oftentimes, uh, a tax collector would also walk around with Roman soldiers and actually cheat people out of three to four times of the amount actually owed. So if you only owed $100 in taxes, they would actually cheat you out of three or 400 and actually walk around with spears and say, give me more money. So um, let's just say um, you're going to do some Black Friday shopping, right? Or uh, maybe you're watching online, you're the Cyber Monday people, of course. And so um, you're going to do your deal on, on Monday. But let's say you could do some Black Friday shopping and you've got a shopping list and you've got to get something for the grandkids. You've got to get something for your friends. You've got to get something for your spouse. And, and you're at the mall and you've got all of these bags and you're in the parking lot. And this is what a tax collector would do. He would walk up to you and say, hey, did you pay taxes on that? You go, yeah, here. Here's the receipt. He said, well, uh, give, give me three times that right now. You go, why? I already paid my taxes. I said, give me more money. And there was nothing that you could do. Uh, you couldn't call the police. They were the police. Who were you going to, you would just get, you would get him. And so the, the, they became the, the most hated people um, in society. So tax collectors became very rich, but very lonely. Um, they, they had everything in the world that money could buy. The only problem is, is money couldn't buy them purpose. Money couldn't buy them friends. The only friends that a tax collector would have were other tax collectors. I mean, literally... Uh, tax collectors are so bad that in the Bible, the Bible says that Jesus was eating with sinners and tax collectors, okay? Like, they had their own category, okay? Like, even a murderer was like, at least I'm not a tax collector. <laughs> uh, I mean, like, like in, the, in the holy word of God, that's how they're described. The, the authors of these stories are trying to tell us something. Why in the world would Jesus start with the worst of the worst? when he needs the best of the best, especially if the goal is to save the world. Now, why in the world would the Bible tell us that this tax collector, this scum of society, this very lonely individual, this guy that's got money, he has what a lot of the world is searching for, but somehow that's not making him happy. Yet the Bible tells us this, that Jesus walks by his booth and gives him a two-word invitation. Follow me. And the Bible simply says this. He got up. He rose and followed him immediately. Now, why in the world would a guy that's got all this money and has success by the world's eyes immediately get up from just a two-word invitation? For us to understand that, we must understand the art of the invitation and why it was such a big deal in the first place. And it's a big deal because in the Jewish educational system, there were three levels of education. The first level was from ages 6 to 10, in which a young boy would actually memorize what we know as the first five books of the Bible, known as the Torah. 
memorized. You'd be able to walk up to a seven-year-old, and if any of you have a seven-year-old, you know how hard this is to imagine, but you could walk up to a seven-year-old and say, can you please repeat for me off the top of your head Leviticus 13, verse 6, and immediately off the top of his head, he would be able to recite it. Memorize. No notes. Memorize. This is what six... Six, six-year-old boys and 10-year-old boys would be able to do. Second level was ages 10 to 14. And at the second level, um, they would memorize what we now know as the entire Old Testament. Memorized. I mean, some of us struggle with Psalms 23. Okay, just think about that for a second. Like, memorize. We'll be able to walk up to a 12-year-old that's ordering chicken nuggets off of the kids' menu and be able to say, hey, by the way, can you tell me what Isaiah 34 verse 3 says? And off the top of his head, he will be memorized. These were extraordinary young men. And then uh, on the third level, uh, they would be trained uh, with the art of answering a question with a question. Some of us, when someone asks us a question, we feel like, well, let me give them an answer. But the Jewish art at the third level was go, don't answer a question with an answer. Answer a question with a question. So oftentimes you will see somebody try and trap Jesus with a question, and then he would simply ask them a better question. Some people say that Jesus has all the answers. I say Jesus has all the right questions. So they they would learn this art at, at level three, and they would become masters of the text. Masters of the text, and they would be they would go back and forth. Think Harvard. I mean, like th- this is like next level Jewish education. And then now, if you were the best of the best, I- I'm talking like like you you were the best Harvard grad law student. Like you you're the greatest. Then a, a rabbi would approach you, and then they were trying not to see if you knew a bunch of Bible verses. They were trying to see if you could live life in a way that would mirror them. That if you could be just like the rabbi in every single way. Could you spend money like them? Could you talk like them? Could you dress like them? Could you behave like them? Could you throw parties like them? And they were testing these young men to see what was in them. And if they got to a point where they believed in the student enough, they would simply say two words to the student. Follow me. Two words. Follow me. And then that student would do everything in his power to become like that rabbi and to take on his way of seeing the scriptures in which they would call that a yoke. That's why when you hear Jesus say, my yoke is easy, what he is saying is my perspective and how I see the scripture is easy. And everyone else has put on this burdensome, this is, these are all the long list of rules of everything that you have to do to get connected with God. I'm going to break it down in two commandments. Love God, love others. And so he's going, my yoke is easy. And so literally, that there were students that when they would follow a rabbi, um, if the rabbi had a limp from old age, um, these young boys who were fully healthy and fully athletic, they would break off a branch off a tree. And they would be, pretend to walk with a limp just to be like their rabbi. This was the most prestigious invitation that anyone could receive in Jesus' day. And... It was only extended to the best of the best. But Jesus walks by a tax collector's booth and extends an invitation reserved for the best of the best, and he extended it to the worst of the worst. Jesus is up to something. Jesus is, he's got a plan. We're going, whoa, 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 Jesus, uh, do you not realize Your mission is to save the world. And Jesus is going, I know. I'm going to start with my team. I have to be able to save him before I can save everybody else. In fact, I don't think that Levi understood what would happen when he got up. I don't think it fully set in for him that he, him getting up would actually allow you to get up. I don't think he knew that. But I can tell you who did. Our all-knowing God. Jesus, who's walking by going, wait a, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I'm going to save the world, 
if I could get Levi to get up, I bet I could give everybody a chance to get up. All of a sudden, everyone's welcome. Because most people believed that for you to get an invitation like follow me, it had to be earned. You, you had to be good enough. You had to be qualified. You had to go through years of vigorous testing and proving yourself to somebody that would then you would earn their love. And all of a sudden, Jesus is extending it to somebody that absolutely doesn't deserve it. In fact, when Jesus says, follow me, what you don't see in this scripture, what it doesn't say in the Bible is that Levi most likely said first, me. And the crowd around them most likely said, it was him? Jesus, you've lost it. He's going, yeah, and I want to get it back. I, 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 I want to get humanity back on track to where, to where they're supposed to be. And, 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 I, and I just realized that in 2017, a bunch of people in the 815 and in Florida and, and God behind bars, there would be some people that would be stuck at a table and they would just, they would need to figure out a way to get up and they don't know how to get up and that they feel trapped and maybe they're trapped by their money, maybe they're trapped by their insecurity, maybe they're trapped by their mediocrity. Maybe they're trapped by something somebody said to them a long time ago, and I just, I know they're going to need to get up, and so I can't start my team with the best of the best. I got to start my team with the worst of the worst so that people that are down and out and people that have, have had a, a not fair shake in life and for people that have been divorced and people that have lost a lot and people that have found themselves in bankruptcy could have a chance to get up. Yeah. And, all, and all of a sudden... It, the invitation is, is absolutely changed. What you, what you got to understand is that these boys, when they weren't selected, when they weren't qualified, a rabbi would tell them, go home and just do the family trade. Go home and just be a fisherman. Go home and just be a carpenter. Go home and just do whatever dad did. Just go ahead and repeat history. That, that, that's all we have for you today. You don't have what it takes to, to be me. All of a sudden, a tax collector, the worst of the worst, is looked at by the greatest man in history, and he goes, you could be me. You, you've, I'm, I'm going to give you a chance. And he's going, how in the world is that even possible? He's, Jesus is going, because I'm going to close the gap. And, what he, and this, this, is, this is why it's called good news. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Levi's going, I'm not good enough to be you. <laughs> Jesus is going, I know, that's why I came, so I could become you. And I'm going to not die just for you, I'm going to die as you, so you can be like me. So when you stand before God someday, you will stand clothed in me. I'm going to take on your pain. I'm going to take on your sin. And I'm going to become you. That's how you're now good enough. You, you have to understand some. Everyone is welcome. Everyone in this room is qualified for the invitation. But make no mistake about it. This is not an invitation where you get to get up from your table and you get to keep the table. I mean, he, it, it, the Bible doesn't say he rose and followed him. He was, I'm coming, Jesus. Some of you want to follow Jesus and do what you want at the same time. It's not how it works. Every, everyone's given the invitation, but the RSVP will cost you something. You, you don't just get to do whatever. You, again, there, there can be this, this mixed signal of, man, I can just do whatever I want and God's grace will cover. God's grace will cover you, but... But I'm spending my life responding to the fact that I was given an invitation at my worst. That is not an excuse to continue doing the worst. If anything, it's the opposite. I want to respond to my life to go, Lord, I'm sorry. I can't even believe that you would even extend the invitation. I can't even believe after everything that I've done that you would continue to use me. Lord, I, I'm just, Lord, you can have this.
We sang, you, you can have it all, Lord, but for some of us, it's you can have some, Lord. Some small parts of my life, Lord. But you, you still want to just do whatever you want. Can I, I just ask you something? Now, with you in the driver's seat of your life, how has that worked out historically? Where has that gotten you thus far? Mama, I get, I get to lead a, a, a community of young professionals in Dallas, and, and they're so funny. They're always talking to me about um, their dating stuff. And, and every now and then, I'll introduce them just to a really great man of God, a really great woman of God. I'll be like, hey, man, I, th- I think that's a good look for you, bro. Or, man, y'all should, y'all should date with her. And then they'll, like, pull me to the side. They'll be like, you know what I mean? I just, I just, uh, just not attracted to that. All right? I, I can't make it. I, I mean, I'm not going to force you to do that, you know? And then I'll talk to the next one. Like, I mean, you know, Ryan, I just, I'm just not attracted to them. You know, I'm like, okay. So you're telling me you got this man of God, this woman of God, you're just saying no because you don't like how they, how, what, what, what's the, yeah, I don't know, I just don't know if they're my type. You know, I just, I'm just not sure if I just, you know, I just thought, I'm just not attracted to them. I, just, I said, okay, okay, cool. Hey, can I ask you a question? Um, the, the people you dated last time, were they attractive to you? They're like, yeah, they were attractive. Then, then how come you're not with them no more? <laughs> I think your attractive plan ain't working. <laughs> Call me crazy. I, I mean, we could do this all day. How many people consistently repeat the same decisions expecting different results? At what point are you going to surrender your decision-making process to somebody else that can do better with your life than you can? He wants to be Lord, not so he, he's, not, he's not a control freak. He's watching you. He's seeing what you're doing with your own life. He's going, I want to help them. Man, I just, he, God's not interested in just your, your dating life. He, he, he's looking at it through a lens of the children that you're going to raise in, a, in the next generation. And you're, you're trying to figure out if they're dateable? It's not bad, it's just too small. In light of everything that God wants to do with your life. Man, when you follow Jesus, you're surrendering decisions. You're going, Lord, if this is the person that you've brought in my life, why in the world would I say no? If this is a job that you've brought to my life, even though I might not like the job and it may not be exactly up my alley, but Lord, if you gave it to me, I'm just going to live with the belief that there's somebody here that needs to know you or there's something in here that's going to grow me on some level. So Lord, uh, you, it's all yours. I'm, I'm going to follow you. You, you, you. My life is completely in, in your hands. I, I, don't, I don't know what you need to get up from today. I don't know what's got you stuck at your table, but I, I just, I wanted to tell somebody today why I got up. You see, um, in 1999, there was a, a massive shooting at Columbine High School. Two shooters, Eric and Dylan, walk into the school and they start shooting everywhere. And they find this girl named Rachel Scott. Rachel Scott was a Christian. She had reached out to Eric and Dylan. They knew she was a Christian. They found Rachel and they pulled her up by her hair, hanging her there. They put a gun to her chest and said, do you believe in your God now? She said, yes. The bullet went through her heart and through her book bag. Inside her book bag was a journal. On the back of the journal, it said, I will not be labeled as average. And the bullet hole went through the word average as if it was the exclamation point on her life. And I I remember seeing that in eighth grade and just thinking to myself, what are you doing, Ryan? Like, whatever you've been doing up until this point wasn't really living. That's a girl that really lived. I mean, that's when the faith really becomes real to you, not when you're ready to just live for Jesus, but when you would be willing to die for him. All of a sudden, you wake up with something inside your belly that gets you out of bed in the morning, and I went, I, I want that type of faith. I don't want Sunday morning type of faith. I, I don't want Wednesday night type of faith. I don't want youth group type of faith. I want something that gets me out of bed on a Monday morning to give my life a purpose. And then for the, the rest of high school, I wrote on my hand with those little gel pens. Remember those? And I, I would write, I will not be labeled as average. People ask me all the time, man, you're always just going for it. Man, you, you just, it's like you don't have any fears. It's like, dude, I can't be average, man. 
I, I, I will not be labeled as average, man. You, you don't know who I'm living for. Like, I, I, I don't live for myself. I, I don't just do stuff. Like, I'm following a rabbi. He's in control of my life, and I just... So when he asked me to do something, it might be crazy to you, but I would be crazy not to do it when the king of kings told me to do it. So um, I'm just a person that's just going, I'm just, I'm just surrendered, and, and I'm not the one trying to be in control of the result. So you go, man, dude, tell me how you write books, man. What, what is that process like? And it's just, I don't write books to, to be a successful author. I write books because I know it helps people. And I don't get caught up in how many people and how many books have you sold and how many... I'm just obedient. I just, I just write it. And then I put it on Amazon. Hello. <laughs> and then I, I let God take care of the results. I, I don't get deep into the marketing. I don't, I don't get deep into the promotion. I don't, I don't. I just trust the rabbi. I, I'm just a young boy that got up from his table 18 years ago and just decided to live my life to the fullest. John 10, 10 says, Jesus speaking, I have come that they may have life and life to the fullest. And I don't know about you, but I, I wouldn't want to miss out on that. And, and the beautiful thing about it, about what the Bible says, is I love it in Ephesians chapter 3. The Bible says, when you read this, this is Paul speaking. He says, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. When you read the New Testament, you'll see that word every now and then, the mystery of God, the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And then verse 6 says this, This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Uh, here, here's what that means. You, you may read in the New Testament, you'll see words like Jews and Gentiles. And, and, and let me just explain that for a second. Um, you'll see in the Old Testament that Jews clearly had a special relationship, special, what the Bible calls covenant with Jews. And, and, and Jews had this belief that it was like, well, we've got this special deal going on and nobody else does. We've got this protection. We, we've got this blessing. It's ours to covet. And we are looking for a Messiah to come and save us and rescue us actually from the Roman government at the time. And what Paul is going, he's going, hey, here's the deal. A Gentile is simply anybody not Jew. So, so what Paul is saying, he's going, here's the mystery of the gospel. Everyone is welcome. They're like the special relationship, the special covenant that used to just be reserved for one particular type of people has now been made available to everyone through Christ Jesus. That's why it's good news. Because if you were on the outside looking in, you go, I'm not good enough. And I can never be true. Hey, that, that's how it used to be. And I wonder how many people are here today and they're going, I'm on the outside looking in. I'll never know that many Bible verses. I'll never be as spiritual as those guys in the front. I'll never be. I'll never be. I'll never be. Jesus is going, the invitation has been extended to you. I have closed the gap. Everyone is welcome. The question you have to ask yourself is, will you accept the invitation? Will you really follow Jesus? And I mean really, really follow him to the point where you surrendered everything to him. Your money, your time, your schedule, your relationships, your career that you've worked so hard to get. Would you give that to him? Everything you have. Would you leave your table for it? Where has you been in charge of your own life? Gotten you thus far. You have a God that desperately wants to guide you, not because he's a control freak, but because he... He has a destination that he desires for you, that is best for you, that can do more for you than any career or any amount of money. And I believe that when, when we accept what Jesus has done for us, we find our place. We, we find that we actually have a place that we can really 
belong. And, and we realize that everyone has had the invitation extended to them. There is nobody in this building that can earn the invitation. Maybe you've heard your entire life that you need to believe in Jesus. I agree. But beyond that, what, what you need to know the good news of the gospel is, is that Jesus believed in you enough to extend the invitation. Jesus believed in Levi enough. He didn't believe in who he was. He believed in who he could be. So he gave him a shot. And he offers that same invitation to each and every person today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give uh, each and every person an opportunity um, to, to make Jesus the Lord of their life. Uh, maybe uh, you're in this place, you were brought here by a friend, or maybe it's, it's your first time, and you say, you know what, man, I, I've, I've seen where my life has gotten up to this point, and, and I, need, I need saving, and I need guidance. I need, I, need, I, need, I need somebody else to be in charge. You're in the perfect place. Maybe they're here today, and you've wandered away uh, from the community of faith for a while. You feel like you've wandered away from God, and, and today um, is the day that you're going to come back home. And you say you want to rededicate your life to Christ. Um, if that's you, if, if you say, hey, I want to give my life to Christ for the first time, or I want to rededicate my life to Christ, would you just slip up your hand with no one watching? I see your hand back there. That's awesome. Is there anybody else? I see your hand, man. That's awesome. I see your hand. I see your hand. There are hands all over. Is there anybody else? Hey, church family, can we all say this prayer out loud together? Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. I ask now that you would come into my heart and that you would be Lord of all. My life, my decisions, my time, my resources. Your blood washes me clean. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Come on, can we make some noise for every single person? that gave their life to Christ. It's, it's literally the best decision you've ever made in your entire life. And if you made that decision today, if you gave your life to Christ or you rededicated your life to Christ, uh, we would love uh, to connect with you at the Next Steps booth uh, right out there in the lobby. Please uh, go by and see us. We, we would love to uh, get you some resources and, and perhaps get you connected with a life group to say, hey, here are some, some great people to, to get around to help you walk uh, through your journey. Once again, can we make some noise for every single person that gave their life to Christ? Um, our, our prayer team uh, will be available down here uh, at the front. If you need prayer for anything, have a, a great week uh, with your family and friends. See you.